Hi, everybody. Hi. Good evening. I think we're going to get started. Um, so, um, first of all, um, my name is Lori Wong. I'm a senior lecturer here uh, at the Courtauld. Um, and I, I teach in the conservation department. And I, um, as well as my colleagues here, in the conservation department, really warmly welcome you to the portal tonight. We are just absolutely thrilled by the number of people who have turned out um, for this event tonight. Uh, we hope that this will be the first of many more events where we're bringing um, conservation students, emerging professionals, um, conservation scientists, conservators um, from all over to come and participate. I think we need to really do more of these across institutional events. Um, we are um, really thrilled today uh, to have um, actually my former colleagues, because prior to coming to the Courtauld, I was at the Getty for 20 years. Um, so I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce the, th the three speakers tonight. And they are going to be um, introducing the project, so I'm not going to talk about the project at all right now. Um, so let me first introduce uh, the speakers. And I will say um, that they come from LA, and they are here in February. Um, but I, I have to say, that for those of you who have been watching the news, there was a huge uh, rain event in Los Angeles. So I actually think they had better weather here in London <laughs> for part of their stay, <laughs> which is not often that we can say that. Um, but we, they did miss uh, a, a big rainstorm and a small earthquake. <laughs> Um, okay, so the first speaker tonight um, is Vincent Beltran. So Vincent is a scientist um, at GCI, so the Getty Conservation Institute, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, Vincent is part of the Preventive Conservation Research Team and the Managing Collections Environment Initiative, or MCE. Um, and Vincent I, has been a colleague of mine for many, many, many years. Um, and his research and his teaching includes the assessment of environmental management systems in hot and humid climates, evaluations of packing case performance during transit, and advancing microfading tester practice. So for those of you who are interested in that, um, feel free to find Vincent after this talk. Uh, the second speaker we will have is Mikhail Lukomsky. Uh, he is a senior scientist, and he is head of the preventive conservation research at GCI. His current area of research focuses on the mechanical characterization of historic materials and their responses to changes of environmental parameters, as well as investigations of painted surfaces by advanced optical techniques. And our third speaker is Cecilia Winter. And Cecilia is a project specialist, and she's in the collections department at, at GCI. And Cecilia has worked as a registrar and as a conservator in Brazil and in France. And her focus has been on preventive conservation and collections care, documentation, exhibitions, and loans. And she was previously, prior to coming to the GCI, she was head of the collection and conservation department at the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo and a preventive conservation um, teacher as well. Um, so I am really going to hand over um, to my colleagues. And but before I do that, I just want to say that we are going to follow this with a reception. So I really urge you to stay. Um, and um, there's also going to be some, some light snacks and drinks there. So please do join us after. So I will hand over now to the Managing Collections Environment team. And again, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you will hear me well. My the distance between me and microphone, but maybe it will work. Um, and uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for giving us this opportunity, this possibility to speak with you about what we are doing at Getty Conservation Institute, about our program, our initiative. Um, and uh, also, I would like to assure you that uh, we enjoy being here. Not necessarily because there is a rain in LA and earthquakes. It's really, really <laughs> pleasure to be here with you. And regarding the the, the, the program of today, uh, we will we plan 
designed in such a way that I will just give you a very broad glimpse and introduction of what the Managing Collection Environment Initiative is, and then we'll follow with a brief short presentation. The first will be given by Cecilia, and she will speak about the um, tools for preventive conservation, focusing on assessment and surveys. Then I will follow up with the discussion of some fundamentals application of acoustic emission, and then Vincent will, uh, will talk about the um, practice of microfading test, testing in the preventive conservation. And then we hope for the discussion. But uh, if you will feel like uh, uh, stop us in any moment, ask a question, start some discussion, we are very, very open for that. This is, we would like it to be very informal. And uh, uh, if you feel like uh, some discussion, or, or maybe you will see that there are uh, some message you will not agree with, or you would like to have more explanation, don't hesitate, it's all for discussion and we are very, very open for that. So before we go to the merit of the talks, maybe a few words about the John Paul Getty Trust. Uh, this is a cultural and philanthropic institution. Actually, we've got two locations, one in the uh, Santa Monica, in the more in, toward the city, and one in the Malibu. And this uh, philanthropic institution and cultural institution is dedicated to critical thinking, presentation and preservation of uh, cultural heritage uh, legacy. And it's divided into four programs. You can see here uh, the Getty Re Research Institute, Getty Foundation, uh, Museum, and Getty Conservation Institute. And we are representing the Getty Conservation Institute, which uh, is working to advance conservation practice in visual arts by scientific research, education, training, field projects, dissemination of information. One of the very, very important elements of our work is this crisis of sustainability. We treat it very seriously, and we are very strongly aligned with the Joint Commitment for Climate Action in Cultural Heritage, which was published in 2021 by IIC, ICOM, and ICOMCC. And uh, it's so important for us, for me, that I would like to maybe read this passage. Uh, uh, it means that we recognize that climate crisis represents one of the greatest threats to the uh, 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 threats to the heritage in the world with depleting natural resources, growing inequality and social injustice. And in response to those challenges, it is important for us to adapt, innovate and pioneer the change. And this is why we, the managing collection environments, are working toward defining some solutions to make our museums and general institutions which are collecting and the, uh, and the sharing the cultural heritage more sustainable. But we also know that this is not a simple thing to do. And it was very beautifully put in the IIC and ICOM environment and climate 10 years ago, actually, uh, where we can read that we acknowledge that the issue of collection and um, material environmental requirements is complex. And we, conservators, conservation scientists, should actively seek to explain and unpack those complexities. And actually, the Managing Collection Environment Initiative is working already for around 10 years. And we, in this time, come to a lot of concepts, ideas, processes, which become more and more important for the, uh, for the current times. So Managing Collection Environment Initiative is a collaboration between the Science and Collection Department and the Conservation Institute. And we address sustainable control and management of collection environments for the uh, collecting institutions like museums, galleries, archives, and libraries. And our goal is to provide evidence-based processes and tools which can help those who make decisions about the environments and operations of the museum institutions more sustainable and uh, simply better. Uh, and and, and this, this is very, very uh, highly collaborative project. This may be not very wise, but uh, easy to follow uh, scheme shows that we very much care about uh, about collaboration between policy practice and research and components of our research comprise uh, scientific research case studies education and uh, dissemination within the uh, last years in the gci we build the scientific research capability by building the scientific laboratories which helps us to do the mechanical testing of the materials in different scales and uh, different conditions to better understand how the materials uh, are affected by the uh, instability climate uh, climate conditions. And, and this uh, gives, gives us this opportunity to think about how we can understand the change resulted from 
uh, variations of temperature and humidity uh, in our galleries. We also develop and adapt from the industry uh, um, monitoring techniques which can help us to evaluate the change of the collections so we can uh, being involved in the case studies and specific measurements, able to validate predictive models to see how, whether they work or not, and also use those me measuring techniques as, as a methods to uh, safeguard collections, to, to be an early warning system to tell us if something goes wrong so we can make the right decision. And I will talk a little more about that in my presentation about acoustic emission. Vincent will also address that in the uh, discussing the uh, microfading testing. The results of our, uh, our uh, studies or investigations are always published. We make it, uh, made them totally free and available on our web page. We can find them and download. And those comprise some uh, general discussion about using evidence for making decisions, uh, a lot of uh, guidelines about using specific techniques. And there is one very specific um, publication, recent publication I would like to highlight. This is a uh, Managing Collection Environments Technical Notes and Guidelines, and uh, it, is, it was published very recently, in July 2023, uh, and uh, this is 16 technical notes made by 11 authors, and they are organized by, the, uh, by discussing context and background analysis and uncertainties for the collections, approach to environmental <coughs> management, building, and communicating sustainable change. And this is kind of a summary of the work we did within the last few years in the courses we provide for the many different audiences in the different parts of the world. And finally, we use all this knowledge and all this information in our education activities. So uh, we developed a series of uh, workshops and courses, courses for the mid-career oh, mid professionals and uh, those who in uh, near future may become the, the, the decision makers in the museum institutions. And what we are focusing on is the decision making process itself. So when and how, when and how we can use the uh, knowledge and information available for us or, or how we can gather uh, this uh, knowledge where to look for it. But also the very, very important element of, uh, of this, you know, those courses is networking. We would like to increase the impact of the well-informed decisions by making communities and helping people each other to build the same understand, uh, understanding between the different institutions. And we are blending the technical and interpersonal skills uh, and discuss always processes leading to some conclusions and some strategies rather than particular numbers. And this is because we are very, very, very strongly focused on the pragmatic approach. Uh, we would like the decisions made in our field to be based on risk management principles. We would like to use existing research and uh, look for the more information or perform the studies which can actually inform the decision in a meaningful way. And finally, and this is very important for us, is also to share some museum experience, which is that the many collections are pretty well maintained in the non-ideal conditions. And we are asking those questions, what is needed for our institutions, what is possible, and what is sustainable. And because we are so different, we've got different type of collections, we are different time out zone, different building, and so on and so on, there is no one answer, and we have to accept it. We have to understand that the same question asked for many different situations leads to different answers, and that's okay, because what we finally want to achieve needs to be something meaningful for us, for our audience, for our communities, and we should share the same time of process of thinking rather than the final numbers we would like to have. And so in conclusions, we found uh, that sustainable knowledge-based approaches for climate strategies because of what is happening now in the world are become more viable for us because we've got more tools and information, but also that is because there is a much more thinking into be really sustainable for many reasons. And they actually require combination of things. We need to have a, some synchronized shifts in the policy, research practice, and a lot, a lot of collaboration, which I hope you will agree with us when you see those presentations we are going to show you. And on the other end, I would just like to show you the Managing Collection Environmental Team. On the right side, those more 
the more rectangular pictures, those are the staff, the people working regularly in the science and collection department. On the left, you see our interns. Uh, we always have interns. We are very strongly encourage young people, or it's not <laughs> about being young or not young, but those who are looking for the, for the, for the experience, knowledge, and are interested in doing with us we are very open for uh, for giving people this this uh, uh, opportunities. So, I would like to stop here and now ask Cecilia to follow me with the next presentation. Unless there is some questions right now. I know it was so generic. <laughs> <laughs> no specific questions yet. This is you. Thank you, Michael, and thanks everybody for coming, and thank you, Larry, for uh, inviting us. Um, I was looking at the, the title of my presentation when Mika was showing it, and I think it might be a little bit misleading, because <laughs> what I want to talk exactly, it's not about uh, tools. I don't think I will present anything that you don't know yet, or anything very different or innovative, but I want to question a little bit how we've been using those tools. So to do that, I also want to question how we've been defining uh, our profession. And my, when I say we, I mean, I mean we conservators. I know that there must be other people uh, here in this room, but you're always connected to collection care in general. But I brought here this definition of the ICOM CC and saying that conservation, it's all measures and actions aimed at safeguarding tangible cultural heritage while ensuring its accessibility to present and future generations. And then it goes on to explain uh, different types of preventive, uh, remedial, and restoration. All measures and actions should respect the significance and the physical properties of the cultural heritage item. And so the first thing that I wanted to think about when looking at this definition is this idea that there is a, a dilemma and a, between conservation and access and that we should find a balance between those two things. Because if we look at the definition itself, we are looking to guarantee the accessibility in the present, but also the accessibility in the future. So actually, we can think about conservation as only deferred access. So from this, we can also already start to thinking, OK, we're saving these things now, preventing micro cracking and micro fading and micro micro damage, because we've been, we got really good in detecting those things and preventing those things. But are we really changing the public that's going to have <coughs> access to this in the future? The second thing is the concept of future generations itself. So how, for how many generations are we talking about? For Normally, we'd, we would say forever, for a long time. But how long is a long time? And if we take life ex tables of life expectancy for uh, paper, this, this in this case is for uh, paper and yeah. photographic materials, some, some of the the setups for storage, for example, cold storage, are talking to conserve things for more than 11,000 years. Uh, if we think that museums exist only for about 200 years, what exactly are we trying to do? For how long are we trying to keep those things? And one thing that always comes to my mind when we start discussing those things is life expectancy is this short story uh, from uh, Borges. And it's about the story of Edino Funes, this, this guy. He, he falls from a horse and he hits his head. And all of a sudden, he can't forget anything. So he, he makes this exercise of recounting one day, and it takes another day. And then at the end of the show, and it's a really short story. You can find it online. It's, it's really nice. And at, at the end of the day, he dies because he, cannot, he can't fit any more memories in his brain. And sometimes our storages are trying to look like, starting to look a little bit like that. <laughs> and the, the next definition that I'm bringing here, it's 
about preventive conservation because this is what this little talk is going to concentrate and this is mainly what MC is dealing with. So preventive conservation and here again definition by ICOMCC. It's all measures and actions aimed at avoiding and minimizing future deterioration and loss. So here we have <coughs> avoid and minimize damage. And what we all often forget is that change and damage are two different things. And normally when we are talking about damage, we are implying there is some there is a value involved. And we are talking about change, we are talking about the material change. And we got really good in preventing the material change, but a lot of the times we forget that we, what we are aiming to conserve, it's not the stuff, but it's the meaning behind those things. And those things can get a little bit confusing. And you're going to see when Mikhail talks, that he's going to talk a lot about preventing damage, damage and detecting damage, but he will explain why he uses those terms in a different way for physicists are different, but when we are talking to an <coughs> audience of conservator, it might think that we want to prevent every change, but what we need to prevent is damage, and in order to do so, we need to evaluate uh, the meaning of the object. And as I said, we got very good at uh, determining this, all these measures and actions that can make us prevent those micro changes. And we tend to call this best practices. But we, what we never ask is best for whom. And we got really good in, in isolating the object and put it in the dark and in the code. and relative humidity, and we call this best, and we think this is best for the object, but we, of, we often forget the people and the environment and the planet and the financial aspects around this. So this is why I wanted to bring this definition of sustainable <coughs> preventive conservation, and this was proposed by Professor Joel Wickens uh, from uh, Winterthur in Delaware, and she brings this definition that says that sustainable preventive conservation is the process of identifying risks to cultural heritage and putting things in place to reduce these risks while at the same time taking care not to increase risks to people, our planet, and our financial well-being. So here we can think about the three P's of sustainability as well. And this is where I'll bring some of the tools uh, that we use for preventive conservation to see where those tools fit inside of those three P's. So first, we have condition survey. Um, here, it's a theoretical curve made by Jonathan Ashley Smith, um, showing that condition rating when we are considering a, about material loss, it's not a linear, uh, it's not a linear thing because it's it's dependent on the value, and as we just discussed, damage is loss of value, and value depends of, of, of people. So it depends on the context of the object, and it depends on the context of who who is looking at it. The same is valid if we so that 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 curve was a theory, like he imagine that would be something like this, but we do have experimental data from this, this study made by Joe Taylor, and he was measuring the agreement between condition surveys ma made by the same individual and made by two different individuals, and you can see that not even the, the ones made by the same, the same individuals fall close to the recommended levels of agreement. So, we, some, in some cases, we are closer to rolling a dice than to actual agreements. So if you do a condition survey and a condition report, and you have enough uh, time between those two things, even between, you don't agree even with, between yourself. Like, and this could be related to lighting, and it could be related to so many things. But we can see how 
um, subjective this is. And it's not only subjective to the, to the people, but also subject, also depends on the kinds of objects. So if we have an object uh, that it has a plain black back, background, it takes us a while longer to see, uh, sorry, it's easier to see the, it's easier to see the losses and attribute it a loss of value. Otherwise, when we have a very complex design, uh, the small losses in the beginning kind of like you, our eyes don't see it. So it takes us a little bit longer to determine that there is a loss of value. And studies like this, is that perception of damage is something that we are starting to do within MCE and explore different types of types of environments, different types of collections. So we can transform those curves that are hypothetical and more like data. The other two, it's conservation uh, assessments. And here I brought just one example of the benchmarks for collection care and how this, this idea of having a best practice is still present in a lot of the instruments that we're using and making this distinction and uh, saying that some things are better than others despite the context, despite the financial situation of the institution, etc. Uh, also, uh, risk assessment. Risk assessment is already an improvement on those, uh, on those subjectivities. We're trying to uh, bring more numbers and be able to compare apples and apples in a, in a, uh, in a, in a way. I'm not going to enter this subject because it would be very long and I'm trying to keep up my time. But I'm going back uh, to the definition so we can look again uh, what uh, those tools are addressing. So the process of identifying risks to cultural heritage I think this is, we got really good in doing it. We're pretty much well covered. Uh, we have uh, already tools like Harry We have tools to measure impact of pollution. We have tools to measure the impact of light. We have risk assessment methods. We have uh, a variety of tools to uh, evaluate the risk uh, to the collection. We have some tools to, uh, to evaluate the financial uh, impact of our actions, especially after doing a risk assessment, you, com you can combine this with a cost-benefit analysis uh, to determine the priorities and things that, different solutions that would mitigate the same risk and pick within your budget, pick the ones that will mitigate the most uh, the risks in the, the, higher, the higher part of the, the scale. We are also starting to uh, include carbon footprint calculators and life cycle assessments in our analysis. So here we have a few, uh, few tools made specifically for the cultural heritage, such as Stitch that also includes a very big database, uh, not only for preventive, but for treatments as well. So you can calculate the impact of different solvents, and you can uh, compare different solvents that might have the same, uh, <coughs> the same result on the treatment and pick the one that has uh, less impact. You can calculate the impact of different types of material for crating, uh, etc. And you have Julie's Bike and uh, Gallery Climate Co Coalition that are doing uh, calculations for art and transit, impact of exhibition, <coughs> uh, crates, uh, uh, exhibition cases, etc. But how are we uh, how are we measuring the impact on people? So how are we seeing the values, the significance, and the access access? Like how are we because so our costs will be low, our uh, impact in the environment will be low, but also the access to this object will be none. So how are we evaluating this? 
and I bring you one uh, one model that that's not actually a tool. It's more of a proposition made by David uh, David Saunders that he is proposing that we analyze our actions based on five different pillars. And for the first time, we see social and societal uh, parameters included in those considerations, not only the economic and the environment and the operational part of it. And what, the, what I also wanted to bring to you is with all those tools, we might be able to start rethinking how we look at conservation and preventive conservation instead of looking at it just preventing something that we're going to lose. Uh, because if we're thinking about loss, our, our brains, uh, we have biases and, and the way our brains function. And this we, we tend to say that conservators and registers and collection care, we have very high loss aversion, but it's not only us, it's it's the human the human being, that's how the human brain works. And there is a very nice animation uh, here that explains some of, some of, those, uh, some of those biases, but I, I don't have time to show you now, but you can, you can watch it later. But the conclusion is that when we are thinking about uh, loss, our brain is twice as much, the, the fear increased to us twice as much. So if we're thinking we're going to lose something, we just stop and we don't do it. And I think this is maybe an explanation why we become the no people. <laughs> we're always thinking in this framework of, oh, if we do this, we're going to lose, we're going to cause like a, a new loss to the object. So I wanted you to leave here today questioning yourself how can conservation also contribute to create value uh, to the objects and maybe this way it will be easier to rethink our professional and stop being the no people to be the ones that help and make it happen. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now it's my turn and uh, I will talk about acoustic emission monitoring, uh, some fundamentals and application of some particular methodology for uh, as a tool for uh, helping to make decisions in the preventive uh, conservation. And uh, in a way, I feel like I'm stepping back uh, from Cecilia already said, because here I will focus on some very specifically technical aspect of making decision based uh, on using technique measuring the physical change of the objects, which, as Cecilia already pointed, is just a change. But from the mechanical point of view, the permanent change, we think about it as a damage. So there may be confusion in this stuff, that's true, but it's, I, I, I don't meant to confuse anybody. And before I go to that, I'd like to say that that's okay, some kind of simplification now after all this talk of Cecilia, but generally um, the, the sustainable control and development of collection uh, environments in the museum is complex because we've got this, on the one side, some uh, contradiction between some, some uh, needs for the collection and what our, for our operation, but also some synergy in some areas. So we would like to rethink the, the collection curve from a variety of angles. This research, policy, practice, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and still, I think that if we would like to make some meaningful decision for the uh, preservation and well-being of our collection, we still need to think about physical change, because it's a pillar of our, uh, our decisions. So if we cannot understand how the environmental conditions influence our collection in physical uh, way, we don't have this fuel, we don't have this information which can help us to make next step. So that's not enough, but it's a very, very important step. So what I would say that if you would like to rethink climate control strategy just from the point of view of safety of the collection, we have to understand how the uh, climatic 
conditions or microclimate conditions are influencing the physical aspects of objects in our collections. And what we are typically doing is that the process is like that. We are thinking uh, what are our objects in the collection. So we would like to know the construction materials preservation state. And also we would like to collect as much information as we can about en environmental conditions currently and in past. And then by using some damage functions, so understanding how uh, unstable conditions influence the objects, we can define the, uh, the pre uh, preservation strategy in which we will accept or not accept some particular object. Because we have to remember that it is impossible to develop a, a preservation strategy on the basis that there will be no any change. That, that, that's, just, that's just something which in reality cannot happen. So we have to have this mindset to say that some change is acceptable and some change is not acceptable. So, and I'm specifically talking here about physical damage to the collection because in very, very uh, many situations, uh, the very strict control of the temperature and humidity in museums, which is extremely expensive, is based on the assumption that those changes are going to be very, uh, very bad for the, you know, for the hygroscopic objects which responds to change uh, of temperature and humidity. So the critical element of this thing is the, the definition of damage function. So understanding this relation between the preservation state or change of preservation state and the conditions. And we are typically doing that by making some modeling informed by the uh, knowing the uh, material properties coming from the mechanical testing. So a lot of laboratory work which uh, helps us to understand materials and then inform the preservation, change of preservation state in different conditions. But the problem here is that we've got excellent models which we can use for that and they are used in the engineering, but in engineering they are used for very well-known materials because we've got a standard method of testing that. And predictive models require very accurate data about mechanical properties of materials and their interaction with environmental conditions. And we very often don't have very accurate information because first, we may not know the material properties of the objects we are interested in, and also uh, we may not know the aging, uh, uh, aging processes uh, of that. So there is some kind of other way to do that, and I'm not saying it's a bad idea, it's still very, very uh, valid and good way of analyzing the uh, influence of the conditions on the objects, but the other way to do that is actually monitoring micro changes for these susceptible objects in the collection. And if you do that, think about it in this way. We can, we can decide, okay, we don't really know how the conditions will affect our objects, but we can introduce some change. And if we've got very, very sensitive method to look at the changes in the collection, then we may be able to spot the change which we are not happy with early enough to make a mitigation and uh, correct the uh, new strategy so we have uh, results we are happy with. So in this way, we, can, we have something like a safety net. We can, uh, we can explore because we've got a method to clearly see the changes uh, before they become unacceptable. And the additional uh, advantage is that this micro uh, change monitoring is actually helping to validate the uh, numerical models so if we combine those three things together, we have a very effective combination of tools to help us to make decisions about the changes of the physical aspect of the objects. And uh, although it's a very uh, attractive uh, method and very, very, very attractive approach, it's not that very simple because the, uh, the, the materials are complicated. So even if, even if we think about the wooden objects, there still is uh, a, a lot of uh, different problems, structural, and material problems. We've got different types of construction surfaces, time of response, and uh, also we have a different deterioration uh, uh, phenomena, like uh, cracking, delamination, deformation, cracking of the surface. And uh, therefore, if we think about the ideal monitoring techniques, this should be uh, non-destructive for kind of obvious reason. Uh, <laughs> sensitive to various damage processes, so that's maybe a problematic, as I show you in a moment. And also, this is very important, it's, it should be not only very sensitive, but we need to be able to repeat it very frequently, because this is the only way in which we'll be able to spot the change early enough. And in other laboratories in Los Angeles, we explore 
combination of different methods to monitor response of the uh, wooden objects. And wooden objects are good for that because they are actually responding, like wooden responding uh, uh, very significantly to change of the uh, humidity. So it's easy to think about that those objects are especially susceptible to uh, unstable climatic conditions. And we were exploring the uh, three different techniques, photography, three-dimensional scanning, and acoustic emission. And the uh, photography and 3D scanning, because they are quite accessible in the museum situation, uh, photographic, obviously, there is a lot happening with the photography in the uh, museum environment. Uh, and 3D scanning become more and more uh, accessible for the museums because of the um, about the, uh, the preparation or the mounting uh, objects in the galleries. And those two techniques are kind of complementary if we think about the deformation and the surface cracking and the delamination. Uh, so th that's a very nice combination. And then we added to the acoustic emission, mostly because it's very, very difficult to find the method which would be, which inform us about the brittle cracking in the volume of the material, and actually acoustic emission can do that. Uh, so what is acoustic emission? Acoustic emission is the, is allows us to detect, detect micro fracturing by measuring elastic waves released during stress relaxation in the material. Nobody is protesting. It's <laughs> actually <laughs> extremely complicated sentence, and it means something very, very simple. So, so I will explain what it means. Uh, it means that if we've got the, any crack in the volume of the material, and it's a triple material, this crack uh, releases the energy in a uh, form of the acoustic wave. And this acoustic wave can travel, uh, no, not can, is traveling through the material and can be captured on the surface by the microphones, which are then transferring the signal and changing it to the electrical signal, and it can be stored in the, uh, in the system. So, uh, so there are some beautiful features of the acoustic emission. The acoustic emission ha help us to detect the microcracking uh, with the very, very, very high sensitivity. We are talking the micrometers increase uh, of the crack surface uh, within the volume. It ha helps us to record cumulative micro damage over a long period of time, which means that the method is passive, is connected to the system, and is continuously uh, listening to the objects, and we are cumulating over the time changes, so we are able to, at any moment, see how the objects uh, behaves. And we have some absolute calibration of acoustic emission, so we can translate the, uh, the captured signal in sense of the amount of damage accumulated in the object. And here you see some kind of a typical trace of acoustic emission measured uh, in a time, in a, uh, some experimental setup. So we go from time to time if the object is exposed to some stimuli, some acoustic emission events, and each of these events has got a very complex characteristic showing the, the amplitude, frequency, race time, and so on. And on the basis of this characteristic, we can make a classification, filtering the discrimination of the events in the uh, in our monitoring. The method is completely passive, so we are not, uh, not uh, subjecting objects to any stimuli, but it's a contact method. So the, the, the drawback is that we have to connect sensors physically to the object, which is not always, uh, always uh, possible. And here I would like to show you some example of using acoustic emission in this uh, laboratory setup in our laboratories. So what we did in this experiment, we select 14 museum-like objects, so they were not museum objects, but very similar to what we can find in our collections, and we subjected them to changing uh, humidity variations over a long period of time, exposing them to bigger and bigger environmental stresses. And what had happened is that at each particular drop of humidity, we were able to uh, collect information about acoustic emission emitted from each of the objects and able to quantify the uh, development mic of micro damage in those uh, objects. And one particular result I would like to show you here is, the, is this uh, lacquer box. Uh, it is interesting uh, for us because actually the damage which was, again, changed. That's, that's changed. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about damage from the mechanical point of view. So the change we observed uh, is, the, is the cracking of the lacquer uh, lacquer, um, uh, which is covering the, the, the okay, the, 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 if you look at the, that, the bottom part, you've got the uh, wooden element uh, with the grains in the vertical di direction, but the sides on the horizontal direction. So obviously, if the humidity is changing, 
we've got this stress on the uh, uh, on the interface and the lacquer on the surface is cracking. So because of that, we were able to, on one side, uh, listen for the acoustic emission and collect those information about the microcracking. At the same time, we were able to look at the photography to see what is the progress <coughs> of the cracking on the surface. And here you see some results of that. So this is when we go down to 20% of relative humidity. This is a sticker which we put there. And there is another cycle to 20, so there's a little more, and 70, a little more. That's very little. In that before we go down to 20% of relative humidity, there was practically nothing happening with the objects. But then we observed some very minor, but still some increase of the length of the crack, and we were able to correlate both acoustic emission with the, with the, uh, with the photography. So it kind of proved that what we measuring has got sense. And there is no perfect correlation, but it's great, because please remember that what we uh, have from the acoustic emission is much more than photography, because we are also looking inside the material, not looking, but hearing from inside of the material, so we've got information about this cracking in the volume. So what I can say is that acoustic emission, uh, when it's applied for the museum objects, uh, allow us to establish correlation between the micro damage and climatic conditions for objects of different size, construction, and state of preservation, as long as those objects are made from the brittle materials. And uh, because of that, we've got a very clear idea about the very, some, some practical application of that. The amazing sensitivity of acoustic emission uh, gives us this ability of the system to work as an early warning system for museum objects and collections, and we actually uh, use this system in many different <coughs> places to monitor objects during the implementing different climate control strategies and be able to, uh, to inform how those new conditions are influencing the preservation state of the objects. The important thing of this is uh, you can think about this very specific exercise which, uh, which uh, require a lot of collaboration. Because if we are starting to mount the uh, systems, First, we have to decide the type of object we would work with. So this must be object which is meaningful for those who are making decisions. It cannot be random objects. Then we would like to, sensor, to mount the sensors close to specific places, like close to the crack tips, to maximize its sensitivity. So this is clearly work we need to do with conservators who know the objects. Then we would like to filter the noise based, based on frequency surveillance and make interpretation based on the uh, laboratory system calibration. This is clearly work for conservative scientists, facilities, and security staff. So very, very collaborative uh, projects. And uh, I'm talking about this, all this also because we just recently uh, worked with the colleagues from the uh, VNA Museum here in UK. Uh, I've got this information about what the VNA is, but maybe it's not particularly uh, necessary here right now, but if you <laughs> all know very well what DNA is and how a big and diverse collection the museum have. And, but what is important is that the climate control strategy does not rely on extensive use of uh, HVAC system, which has got some consequences. And you here, see here, this is the climate on the, uh, on the furniture gallery, fourth floor at the uh, uh, DNA museum. So there's only moderate climate control in the, in the galleries. Uh, which results in some limited uh, energy consumption. But you also see that sometimes variations of climate are bigger than we would normally expect with the, for the museum uh, or the gallery, which has got the furniture collection. And therefore, it's very attractive or interesting to try to see how those variations of climate actually influence the object and whether it is any problem for the museum or maybe it is not. And therefore, we spent whole week with the colleagues from DNA, making a lot of experiments of objects looking for the uh, tracing the delaminations with some speckle interferometric techniques and also install some acoustic emission systems on the galleries and we have a plan to monitor uh, objects with acoustic emission for another year to actually make some conclusions about the influence of the climate for the collections of susceptible objects. And if you like, and I very, very strongly encourage that, because I'm so proud of what we did together, uh, to, to visit the VNA and see the, uh, the, our system installed in the galleries. So there is one <coughs> object on the European gallery on the first floor, and also the second object in the furniture gallery on the fourth floor. And this 
uh, this, uh, uh, those objects will be monitored, as I said, for the year, and the full information about this uh, project will be displayed uh, here, which I think is interesting way of informing uh, audience about what is happening in the gallery. So what I would like to say that acoustic emission monitoring helps us implementing new climate control strategies by quantifying the climate-induced uh, damage or change for the objects. And it's creating the, this safety net for, making, for those who are making decisions so they don't have to be so worried that introducing new conditions will immediately result in the and in the non-acceptable change of the object. And this is mostly possible because the climate-induced damage is cumulative and slowly growing up. It's not uh, catastrophic. And uh, one more thing, uh, which I think is very important, it's a great tool for education and communication. Here you've got some images from the, uh, from the National Gallery of Victoria in Australia, uh, where we uh, make a project where we were monitoring this 16th century um, altarpiece uh, for almost two years. The system is still there, and it's completely visible on the gallery with a lot of information. And I can assure you, I was surprised myself a little, how much attention it, uh, it gathers and how much it is interesting for visitors to understand that the museum is actually taking very seriously the problem of the uh, climate control and trying to find solutions which are more sustainable, but better for the planet, for society, and is taking this in a very uh, modern, uh, modern and uh, progressive way. So on the other hand, I would like to say that the, uh, the, the, the much more complete information about acoustic emission is uh, is uh, already published in one of the power guidelines. You can find this information. And this uh, publication is made for practitioners, so somebody who would like to maybe possibly use this technique. But I also would like to, you to remember that it's not really about technique, but rather about the method of thinking about how we approach the problem. Because uh, if you cannot use the acoustic emission technique, which is maybe complex and uh, and complicated to, to apply, there is many other ways to monitor the collection, whether the basis of this monitoring of the collection, observing the collection, uh, making the condition surveys, make decisions about the uh, changing uh, or optimizing climate in the collections. Thank you. All right, um, so I'll be the third presentation. Um, I'll be switching gears. We've been talking about temperature and relative humidity. Now we're going to focus on light, that, that agent of deterioration. It, it very much follows along the lines of acoustic emission. Microphane testing is a way to predict change. But unlike acoustic emission, it's something that's been a lot more commonplace in heritage institutions around the world. So just some context on light. Obviously, to see our objects, we require light, uh, typically between 50 and 200 lux. But this obviously has a double-edged sword. It's, it's going to cause irre irreversible damage. And objects that are on permanent display and that are highly requested are particularly vulnerable. Now, if you don't have access to direct testing of sensitivity of your object to light, then you have to assume a fairly high sensitivity to light. And that gives you... Um, the drawback of potentially having unnecessary productions and access and increased object rotation, so in increased costs. This image here is from the Canadian Conservation Institute. It was a 100-year-old dress that had been put on display for 10 years, and obviously you can see that change that happened during that really brief period of time. So how do we assess the sensitivity to light beyond MFT? So the first way is to take mock-up samples and put it inside a light box. Generally, your exposure intensity is around 10,000, 20,000 lux. Well, what's great here is you can examine any types of material. But the drawback, which you'll often hear, is that these samples are not reflective of the uniqueness of the object I have. And that's a fair argument. The other way is to directly monitor the color of your object. So have an object use a color, colorimeter or spectrometer to assess color on specific spots, have it on exhibition, check the color afterwards. So it's great because it's in situ on an object, but that object has to undergo change first. 
It's also a really laborious process to unmount an object, to take it out of its frame, to get that spot exactly the same as before uh, exhibition. So Paul Whitmore, shown at left, developed this technique, microfade testing, as a way to accelerate the aging to, to light of an object and to correctly assess its sensitivity to light. And he, he published a paper in 1999 in Studies in Conservation. So it's virtually non-destructive, which is crazy because it means it's destructive, but that's OK. Um, what it allows us to do is to protect the light vastness prior to display. And it also begins to shift this relationship between the conservator and the collections care staff to one that's kind of a, to something that previously was very adversarial, uh, the, the conservator being a gatekeeper of access, to one that's focused on risk management. How can we work in order to increase access to our collection responsibly? It's also the rare technique to emerge within the conservation field, which has consequences for the sustainability of the technique. So I'll, I'll briefly go through the components of the NFT for those that are unaware. I'm showing you the cl classic version of the instrument developed by Paul Whitmore. So first we have the power source here on the bottom right. And that powers the lamp and the filters. And you can see the, the lamp here. And generally, the original used a Xenon arc lamp. And that had this relatively flat spectral power distribution. The spectral power distribution is, in essence, a fingerprint of the light source. We're also using LEDs now, so you can see how different the, uh, uh, the spectral power distribution can be of a cold white LED to a xenon arc, LED, uh, xenon arc source. We also have the controller here, and it's attached to a, a light sensor. And what that serves to do is to stabilize the light source so it doesn't change as you're conducting the test. Then we have our fiber optics, which uh, pass the light from the lamp to the head and from the head to the spectrometer. And here's the schematic of the typical geometry of an MFT. It's 0, 0.45, a light comes down perpendicular on the object. And then at the 45 degree angle, it collects that light and sends it to the, to the spectrometer. This schematic on, on the right shows the importance of aligning the spot, because you want to make sure your spectrometer is assessing the area in which you're inducing change. And the size of our spot size is quite small. And that's part of the reason it's virtually non-destructive. The spot size is on the order of a half millimeter or less. It's also virtually non-destructive because we're constantly monitoring color change during the test. So if we see that the color change is starting to go higher or it's exceeding at a rate that we're comfortable with, we can stop the test before color change is visible to the viewer. And as you can see, our intensity is extremely high. It's around Lux. And if you recall earlier, I spoke about a light box being on the order of 20,000 lux. So we're speaking orders of magnitude difference, and the importance of that is we're trying to get the results quickly. Uh, finally, the pos positioning system here, you can see that our head is attached to this microscope stand. There are other ways of doing it. Here we have the head attached to a hor horizontal gantry. So it really just depends on your, uh, your preference for mounting. And then finally, uh, the data goes to the spectrometer, and then it's collected by our computer. Now, I showed you the original Whitmore version of the MFT. The more um, common version that institutions have been purchasing is this instrument by Fotonove. And we actually also have a Photonovae in addition to our Whitmore down. You might ask, why do we need so many MFTs? But there are specific motivations for that. And there are three for us. The first one, it's more portable than the Whitmore version, which has multiple com components. The Photonovae has a very small footprint. It also has some automation, which can make it a little bit easier to transfer use from user to user. And then, in particular, we were interested in loaning this instrument out. Uh, the cost of 
a wet more or more of photonova is around forty thousand U.S. dollars. So it's not exorbitant, but it's probably out of the realm of a typical purchase of a small to medium-sized institution. Mm -hmm. So having an, having an instrument like this that we can send to institutions so they can test in situ, understand how the techniques can possibly justify its purchase in the future, I think would be really helpful for the field. So our photonobe is, um, has an LED changer. It switches from six different LEDs, and we have two different changers. So we have six different uh, color, or five different color temperatures, and then we have a bunch of narrow band LEDs. And here are the spectral power distributions of our, our lamp. So I'll quickly talk about how we analyze our data. Um, so we collect spectra. Spectra is the raw information. The y-axis reflectance and the x-axis of wavelength. And we're typically focusing on the visible wavelength range between around 400 to 700 nanometers. <laughs> And you can see here that our spectra is evolving over time. It's starting with the green line, and then over time it's evolving to the red. So there's a change in color that is reflected in a change in the spectra. From this spectrum, we can then determine our colorimetry variables, our L star, A star, B star, and we can position our spots in this LAB sphere. Um, and you can see these two spots, the starting and the ending spot. And then what we can do is we can calculate the color difference, so how much color has changed. And that's simply the, the distance between these two lines in space. So that's called our delta E value. So after we do MFT, we get information on, on the L star, how light or dark the changes are, A star, B star, and then color difference. So the other tool that we often use as a way to kind of bridge our MFT results to our practice is we use this blue wool standard, which is a light decimeter. We commonly focus on blue wools one to three, which talk about um, high light sensitivity materials. So what we do is we conduct MFT on blue wools one, two, three, and we define these color difference curves for each of these blue wool standards. You can see blue wool one fades the most. Um, I actually didn't mention this, but blue wool one is the highest fader. Blue wool two fades twice as slow. Blue wool three, twice as slow as blue wool two. So the order of curves here is what you would expect. Then what we do is we take our analysis on our object or on, on our samples, and we see where they align to those blue wool curves. And this gives us a way of assigning a blue wool equivalence for, for that sample in terms of color change. So you can see sample A here is sitting between blue wool 1 and 2. So we basically call it blue wool 1.5. And sample B here is between blue wool 2 and 3. Now, OK, that's great, but how does it help me in the, the, the gallery? So the blue wool equivalence suggests a, a light dose for just noticeable difference. Um, so as you can see here, we have these values, which are averages, which have been determined from a literature search by Stefan Mikowski. For blue wool one, it's about 300,000 lux hours for a JND dose. For our blue wool two, it's 900,000. And for blue wool three, it's 3 million. And what this does, it, it then defines a budget for which you can play with in, in order to figure out how you want to, how do you want to use your exhibition time. There are some variabilities in the, the JND dose, but I won't focus on that in a moment or time. So here's, here's how one might use that. So I do my MFT test, I find out this thing's pretty sensitive. I have a blue wool equivalence of blue wool one. So I'm assume a 300,000 JND to light dose. So then I can start playing with these different scenarios. So I can have a lux value of 50,000 or 50 lux. And if I do that, that means I have 6,000 hours that I can use in order to keep the change uh, be uh, level on JND. <laughs> if I extend the, um, the exposure to 100 lux, that number of hours drops to 3,000. 
And then if I extend it to 200, that number of hours drops to 1,500. So here's where you start to have this dialogue with your curatorial team, your exhibition team on how are we going to display this object when it goes on exhibition, trying to keep it you know, as pristine as we want in terms of that j &D value. So this is all theoretical stuff. Now I just want to show you how this plays out um, in, in the field. And I'll start by showing this case study that was presented by Bruce Ford and Nicola Smith at the ICOM CC. And it's this really beautiful case study. He, he did MFT on early 20th century album with hand colored photographs. Here's the image of the photographs prior to exhibition. And what Bruce did is he did MFT on this object prior. So you can see the curves here. Here's our blue O1, blue O2, blue O3 curves. And these are the different colors that he tested. So he saw that cyan was extremely fugitive and green was also fugitive. They were sitting above blue O1, so they're more fugitive than blue O1. Uh, yellow, red, and brown were not as sensitive. They were between blue O2 and 3. So what happened is he, just, he, he suggested that this object have frequent page turns to limit the amount of change that happened on this object. Unfortunately, the object was put on display without changes, which is terrible for the object. But it's this really interesting scenario to first to ground truth that MFT, MFT data. So let's focus, I'm going to show you some before and after. So here's before. Let's focus on that spot 12, the, the sky area, cyan, extremely fugitive. So here's before, here's after. So let's turn that again, before, after. So it changed, it was, it was gone through that uh, display. So now let's focus on the red, so this spot 11. So this wasn't as sensitive, this was between blue old 2 and 3, so it's not supposed to change as much. Uh, cyan, but here's before, here's after. So again, before and after. So what this shows is that the predicted, the, the predictions that MFT posed held true in the actual display of this object, which is, you know, I think more case studies like this allow us to have more confidence in the technique, more, more confidence in applying the results. Just a few other case studies. Um, at the, at the Getty Research Institute, they had a project, or they had a, a display of some exhibition of ballpoint pen ink. So it, if you look at the literature, generally it says ballpoint pen ink is very sensitive, um, high sensitivity to light. Bruce Ford also did a study of about 100 inks. He actually showed something different, that some were very fugitive and some weren't that fugitive. So there's this range of sensitivity to light of that type of material. So at the GRI, if they didn't have MFT, they would just assume all these four inks are, are very fugitive. But after doing MFT, uh, the red and blue inks were actually around blue old 2.5. The black ink was about blue old 1.5. And the purple ink was extremely sensitive. So it gave them this opportunity to think about what types of objects are they going to display? Are they going to light them differently? They're, they can now provide more access to the objects that are focused more on the red and blue without having to, to rotate them unnecessarily during the exhibition. And then finally, uh, just a Bauhaus exhibition. Um, there were 200 works that were going on display, and they, bought, they were very um, they were very curious how they were sensitive to light. So what they did was they conducted MFT on 40 objects before exhibition. And here's what they found. So again, prior to exhibition, they assumed everything was sensitive. But if we look at this distribution, the majority of the objects were blue all three or blue all two to three. So again, they weren't as sensitive as they thought. And that's actually one of the beauties of MFT. Of course, we're trying to find the things that are sensitive to light, but oftentimes we're finding things that you didn't think were as sensitive. I think I've said that wrong. We're finding <laughs> it's so crucial that I don't even notice it. Um, oftentimes you're finding out that your object is not as sensitive to light as you thought it was. Okay. All right, so um, 
Now I'm talking about the community of NFT, and I'll try to wrap it up fairly quickly. So there's a few obstacles to um, setting up this community. And the first thing is that NFT is coming out of the conservation field. It, unlike other techniques like XRF or ramen, it's not coming from a bigger field with strong support from the commercial sector, which means that there isn't really a lot of support for us in, internally. Over the years, there's also been the development of a few different iterations of NFT. Again, it comes to some confusion as to like which one am I supposed to use. And then, you know, people depart from institutions, and sometimes it's hard to maintain that in institutional knowledge. So there have been a few NFT meetings. Um, 2016, there were three. It was actually a hotbed year. Uh, Bobkin, <laughs> New York Conservation Founda uh, Foundation, Gothenburg. And then in 2018, the GCI had a symposium, and we, we had an experts meeting. And this is everyone that uh, came to that meeting. And it identified various paths forward for the field. So trying to organize a self-supporting NFT user community, increase access to small and mid-sized institutions, opportunities for, for training. Um, and from that uh, meeting, we published an experts meeting report, Advancing Microfading Tester Practice, which is available on our website. So following up on those recommendations, we did hold two in-person workshops in 2019 at the American Institute for Conservation and the Western Association for Art Conservation. We had 10 instructors. Uh, we had 44 participants. It was really a way to kind of spread this information. Um, obviously, the pandemic hit soon thereafter, so we weren't able to go forward. But something that we did do as our pandemic passion project was to actually try to collate all this information about MFT in, into a book. So we had this publication in 2021. We tried to follow a lot of the material that was pre presented in the workshop. Um, so we have color science, two chapters on MFT, but there's this chapter which I've always said is the most important chapter because it's about how we develop our lighting policy and the role of MFT in this, in, in, in this process. And this is really a chapter, even if you don't do MFT, this is still a chapter that will be super relevant for you and you can see where MFT fits. Um, and this again is available on our website. So in this thing, we have this MFT institution directory. These are all the MFTs around the world uh, in 2021. This number has increased since then. So the one, um, I think I have two more slides, but the one thing we are working on that should happen very soon is the development of an MFT discussion group with the American Institute for Con Conservation. So, you know, this is very much in the vein of trying to bring all our users together so that we can speak to each other. It actually isn't just for MFT users, it's for anyone interested in MFT or interested in how we develop our lighting policy. It's going to be sponsored by the Preventive Care Network, and it's similar if you know AIC is a material working group and imaging working group, but this is focused on MFT. And it's supporting our international MFT community. Obviously, you saw in the previous slide that many users are outside of the US. And it allows these MFT users to communicate, um, to inform and develop MFT practice, to promote collaboration. But it also encourages discussion, again, on lighting policy, guidance on material light sensitivity, and how these are informed by long-term and accelerated aging studies. So some conclusions. Um, MFT is a really powerful tool to discriminate between something that is sensitive and something that is um, stable. And what's probably great about it is it incorporates the objects, material, composition, and display history. All that is integrated into the result because you're analyzing the object in situ. It also gives us this opportunity to speak about evidence uh, when we're speaking about a lighting policy. As you, as you may know, any accelerated aging technique is going to have some error. There's also some, some error in, embedded in the Blue Wolf standard. But the point is, and this is a quote from Bruce Ford, uncertain data is better than no data. Um, and if you have data, you're able to have these conversations that are going to be more constructive than just saying, don't put it on display. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there is a need for us to support the MFT community. So we hope that you'll join in our effort to kind of understand MFT and all, all the implications. And I do think it's important that we think about access to the instrument. Um, so these instruments are not used 100% of the time at the institution, so there is time for it to be used elsewhere. How can we increase access to smaller and in size heritage institutions? And that ends my presentation. Thank you for your time. So I think we'll have a discussion period. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, those wonderfully rich presentations. Um, we do have some time for, for questions, and, and this is being recorded, so um, we are going to come around with the microphone. Uh, hi, um, I thank you very much for these amazing presentations. I have a question for Lisa. Lisa, if you were in charge of a museum, um, say of the previous collection, would you, if you had access to an NFT, um, would you go around and test every single painting and then always go by you know, the value that, that shows you that a particular color area is the most susceptible and then go from there? Or how would you find if you were in charge of a, or, you know, maybe you found that at the SNC, I don't know, but how would you practically find if it's a whole collection? Well, I would definitely get an MFT first. That would be the first thing. But, I, you know, I think the, the point isn't to do MFT on everything. That, that's impossible. But you focus on the objects that are most significant mm -hmm. to, your, to your collection. What is your top ten? Those are the ones that are vulnerable. Um, and then once you do enough of those objects, it kind of gives you a basis for understanding how to, how to treat some of the other classes of objects you have. But it, it's impossible to really do every object. I think the other important use of MFT is prior to exhibition and exhibition development. You know, because these are objects that are going out on display, maybe they have like multiple institutions. So since they're being put on the front line, that gives you a chance to make sure that they're sturdy enough for the display that you're going to give those objects. And that charter that you mentioned talks exactly about this um, in, the, in the guidelines, how to do a value-based assessment using MFT. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentations. Uh, my question is also for um, about the utility. So I understand that um, it's a technique that came out of conservation. Um, so my question is about reporting the results of NFT. Um, is the data from NFT treated like how we would treat analytical data, say, for example, for, for like in uh, for example, chemistry, uh, the analytical techniques being like, uh, you know, plus minus standard deviation from a number of samples. Um, does that sort of apply to NFT? Um, if you have time, it does. Um, <laughs> because if it is an exhibition, in the process of exhibition, obviously you're drawing a time crunch and you're trying to, you know, do a quick survey of colors on this object. Um, so again, as I was saying before, it's it's Im imperfect data. Like like I, I don't have time to get t twenty mm -hmm. samples of of red, but it it gives me a chance to figure out what's the most fugitive part of this object. And then I think that's where blue wolves come into play as a way to communicate the results. Like, it would be hard pressed to shed the reflectance spectrum and have that apply. So having having blue wolves as this common 
common vocabulary and JNDs to allow the MFT results to actually be practical for the collection care staff. Thank you. Are there questions for Michael? Michael? Um, it's about the experiment. I uh, was wondering when you said it's a long time that you conduct the experiment for. Uh, how long is long uh, to get a meaningful result? Yes. So uh, we can do experiment as long as we want, of course, but the important thing for us is to understand, uh, like, collect the meaningful data. For the most of the cases when we would like to check the influence of the climate control strategy, we think about the like, yearly cycles because we typically think about the seasonal change of the conditions. And uh, if this is the, the gallery or the place when the uh, conditions are very tightly controlled, then there is practically, I mean, we may have a situation where there is no any change during the year, like very, very tight control, mm -hmm. but that's not a very interesting case. The more interesting case is where we actually have some seasonal change, and we would like to observe how this change influences the objects. And we assume that the, that the change uh, of the climate is semi-periodical, so uh, the year is a good representation. So I would say meaningful data for somehow unstable or affected by outside conditions uh, monitoring would be a year. Which is, yes, long, I know. But you don't have to. You know, you, if you think that you have a, some particular instability of the climate right now and you would like to see effect of it, it might be shorter. But you have to remember also that the response of the object is not immediate. So some variations of the temperature, in particular of humidity for the object, which is had a big volume may take some time. So again, to observe the effect of some change of humidity, you need to wait till this change is affecting your objects. But you know, it's 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 a practical decision to be made when planning this kind of a monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question that might actually touch all three of you. I don't know. I saw um, the presentation about your acoustic monitoring before, and I saw it uh, delivered alongside uh, the impact of a group of museums in Australia um, wanting to get together and kind of support each other to adopt broader standards. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, given this is a climate crisis, <laughs> I'm wondering which, how you think we are going to get to change faster through the kind of different presentations that you've made. We've got the kind of evidence, we've got the kind of discussions of value and thinking about these notions of preserving things for the future and notions of time. And I just wonder, because I know you're very close to the urgency of this, just how you feel we're going to move conservation the fastest with these, your, maybe your three-pronged approach, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. A very easy question. <laughs> <laughs> And I think you kind of touch it. Like we we are, we try to go to different fronts. Like I think the MC exists for ten years. Um, in the beginning, and it's in those uh, guidelines. It's in the document for IGMCC and uh, the the interim guidance of 2014. It's it states like it's complex. We need more science. We need more research. And now we're feeling like, OK, we have the research, but people are still asking us, we need more data. It's, every, it's a very common thing. Like, I'm, I'm not ready to do this, because we need more scientific data. So we are moving from sample, like to historical samples, to real objects, now objects in the galleries. And we have this data now. And so this is one front of the scientific front. And I think now we are also trying to understand like how we can implement the change, like translate the scientific data to really implement the change in the field. 
and it has a lot to do with behavior and behavior change and how you do it and how we've been doing some research on how to make decisions under uncertainty because this is something that we'll always have from the point of view of the material but also from the point of view of climate change nobody exactly knows how things are going to change from now on so yeah there's no there's no answer to this but a lot of it is dissemination workshops uh we are evaluating what what's our role as conservator what's the role of collections in in the face of this urgency so can i add something yes i would love to <laughs> I, I would, I'm going to say something which I'm actually not happy with, but I strongly believe that this change we are observing now in thinking about it, the fact that there is so many people who would like to listen about the, the problem of sustainability in museum, it's not because we created so much of the knowledge which helps to make those decisions, which we created. But, but the, the thing is that this change is because of the changing climate very rapidly, uh, about the energy crisis, and the fact that we are really seeing our society, societies be on the edge of some dramatic change. So I think that if not this, what had happened over the last few years and what you observe, there would be no any knowledge who, which would push the, the field. Mm -hmm. So we are in this situation when we can respond to this urgency because we collected this information, knowledge and so on and so forth, but I, I I'm realistic about the motivation. The motivation is a real crisis we are facing. But the good news, if there is any good news here, is that there are methods, tools, ideas uh, which can help uh, make this change happen. Mm -hmm. If I can just add, so I think probably the same exactly the same kind of thing you both said, but <laughs> it's not. It isn't a matter of uh, con convincing museums that it's time to be sustainable. I think that that question has been answered. It's how do we do this? And that's that's where I think a lot of our work feeds into is this, you know, there, there's kind of all this uncertainty, but and and the answer is not the same for every institution. So how do we develop this process so that we can be sustainable given given how how important it is it is to the field? is about how realistic are predictions and, and, the, and, the, and the results of calculations and models because we are not addressing exactly the same materials uh, that exist. And, and there are some, some very good examples of that. For example, if you are thinking about the oil paints, we don't really know how oil paints age. We, we cannot simulate this process. There is no way. And therefore, uh, we at Getty Conservation Institute, we, we invest a lot in the micro-mechanical measurements, so we are trying to collect the samples uh, in the very small scales from the objects to be able to evaluate their properties. But we mostly do that, not because we, do, we know that we will not be able to measure all those historic materials, but we would like to be able to evaluate the value of mock-ups. So try to understand how close we are with our predictions to the realistic materials. And this is something I think similar, like Vincent showed with the uh, NFT and blue uh, standards where you try to match your materials with something we know very well to make those predictions meaningful and so on. So I personally believe that measurements with, uh, of the, uh, the uh, mock-ups and mimic, uh, mimicking materials uh, are very, very valuable because we control them well and we can do a lot of experiments which is difficult to do on historic materials. Uh, we have to, the thing is that in a uh, 
science in general, but in the conservation science maybe in particular, we have to accept some uncertainty and be able to make decisions when we don't have all the information we would like to have. And uh, we have to learn to do that, because not making decision is also a decision. If I, if I didn't, didn't understand, because you, you're talking about conservation materials as well, right? What, yeah. what we are oh, using. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think there is one one concept that it's it's very important to us and and relates to the kinds of treatments that we are doing. That uh, Mikhail can explain a little bit better how it works scientifically. Well, uh, proved fluctuation. So if we know that if an object has been in a, in a range of variations and it's not going to, outside of that range, all the energy has been released. But the minute you do some treatment and you introduce new material, you kind of reset this count to maybe not zero, but to a certain uh, strength. So that's why we are, we are also testing uh, conservation materials, especially animal glues. But, well, but, 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 but you know, generally, I think that the no, going back to the answer to question, is that uh, I think that all we do is just showing that you cannot make any meaningful decisions for your collection without looking at your collection. And uh, there are different ways of doing that. There may be some predictive tools like MFT, maybe the uh, direct tracing of uh, change tools like uh, acoustic emission or condition surveys method like photography, or many different, but always. We cannot just take the information from the book and apply it to our collection without being close to that. So the scientific information is very, very important. Understanding material is very important. We those is basis for our decisions, but without actually looking what is happening in the collection, what is the history of the collection, it doesn't have this power which, which is potentially there. So the when I was talking about collaboration between the conservators, scientists, curators facilitates people, that, that's, I think that's a very real thing. Like, like this, taking those responsibilities for collections together uh, is something which, which can give uh, amazing results. Can I ask a question? Sorry. <laughs> um, I just have one question. Uh, do you think, um, do you know which are the objects are actually more at risk with the climate emergency, and which one actually benefits from the climate emergency? Mm -hmm. Depends on material. Is there anything that we should be that should be prioritized to understand more yeah, how they're going to behave with the climate emergency, and others that we actually would be benefiting because we're going to like mild temperatures in some countries, and maybe there's more trust in issues anymore. And you, you know, uh, maybe I will start, but you would maybe like to follow, I don't know. But, but I would say generally that um, when we are evaluating, uh, like we were discussing for our, I spent so much time on mechanical damage and this micro cracking. But in, in reality, we believe and we observe that the risk of physical change due to unstable temperature it is very main, minor risk in the, uh, in the collections. So sometimes people ask me, why we are spending so much time in energy measuring the micro cracking of the uh, wood or decorative layer when there is such a small risk. And we do that because uh, in most cases, this desire to prevent this damage from mechanical, uh, mechanics of the object is, is creating huge costs for the museum and very unsustainable decisions. So there is this, this discrepancy between the actual risk and the uh, uh, and the actual uh, costs and, and energy. So, so you know, if you think in realistically, in most of the situations, fire, uh, flood, theft, dissociation, and then other uh, agents of deterioration. And if we think about the materials, actually the most endangered materials in our corrections are the polymers because of the temperature, and we really cannot stop this deterioration. We have to somehow accept this change, and uh, so. So, but again, it's very, uh, very museum spe specific, and not only museum specific, but also type of access we would like to uh, provide to collection specific. I don't know if you. No, it's a very difficult 
question to answer without more context, because each reason with that will have a different impact. And but I think one thing that is clear is, for instance, uh, buildings and sites that cannot be moved. Well, <laughs> that's definitely something that will have a great impact. <coughs> Regions will be flooded. Uh, at least the collections, we can move them to, a, to another place. All right, I think if you'll spare us a few more minutes, we wanted to share with you a video. Four minutes. Four minutes, exactly. <laughs> you have to go, you probably understand. But, uh, this, this is an animation that we did to try to explain acoustic emission and not disparaging Mikhail's presentation. <laughs> but I think it's a really fun way to kind of end uh, kind of the presentation. Introducing Acoustic Emission Monitoring, also known as AE, is a technique widely used to inspect the safety of materials under stress. Typically, AE is used to help identify potential issues in components of airplanes, bridges, ships, and pipelines. But did you know it can also be used as a valuable preventive conservation tool? It monitors changes in cultural heritage objects caused by external or environmental factors. Its sensitivity allows collections professionals to detect micro-cracking inside objects, even when they're invisible to the naked eye. This gives us the means to precisely identify environmental events, such as variations in temperature and relative humidity, that may lead to damage. Now let's take a closer look at how AE works. When tiny cracks develop in brittle materials, such as wood, they release energy in the form of ultrasound waves. These waves travel through material and are detected on the surface with piezoelectric sensors. The sensors convert vibrations into electrical signals, which can be analyzed in real time. Studying these signals gives us valuable insights into how the objects are changing and how cracks are propagating. We can even listen to unexpected visitors, like termites. Using a mesh of sensors and triangulation techniques works great to locate the crack position in simple objects, like the pipelines we mentioned earlier. But what about the complex objects collections professionals are used to caring for? Take wood, for example. It presents difficulties due to variations in its properties, such as species and wood grain direction. These variations can attenuate and dampen AE signals traveling through wood, which makes it difficult to accurately capture the signals. To overcome these challenges, it's crucial to have strategic sensor placement near areas prone to damage, such as joints or existing cracks. But there's another obstacle we must deal with, the ultimate gallery party pooper, noise. Monitoring art objects in galleries or historic sites means battling background noise and isolating signals related to object change. So how can we tell the difference between cracking in an object versus visitors chatting in the gallery. To filter out noise, we need to analyze the characteristics of recorded data, such as frequency and amplitude. Low frequency signals below 50 kilohertz typically represent ambient noise, while high frequency signals indicate material fracturing. Pencil lead break tests also help determine the characteristic signals associated with cracking. They're performed regularly to ensure the sensors are in contact with the object and working properly. There's also a way to filter signals unrelated to cracking. It's called anti-correlation. This involves placing two identical sensors on the same or different objects at a distance. If a signal is recorded by both sensors at the same time, the cause is likely due to an event other than localized cracking. So it's filtered from the data set. We also gain valuable information from monitoring the space around objects with cameras. <coughs> when we compare visual observations with moments when the sensors go wild, we see causes of recorded noise and improve the data collected by the AE system. It's like hosting a reality show for wooden objects, gallery visitors, and workers. AE gives us a powerful way to monitor cultural heritage objects. Its precision and sensitivity in detecting potential damage work as a safety net, enabling the development of more sustainable environmental management strategies. The result? Greater access to objects here and now, all while preserving our cultural heritage for generations to come. So 
uh, I just want to just say thank you everybody for coming this evening, coming to the portal, and I hope you will stay and join us and carry on the conversation. Um, with some drinks and some food right next door. Um, and finally, I just want to thank the speakers again for all of their time this evening. Um.